Man, I, I, I love the Word of God. I love it when God's Word comes alive. I love it when God's Word just connects with my situation. And uh, I believe it's going to do that today for you, whatever you're walking through, whatever you're dealing with. And uh, we're going to go to 2 Samuel chapter 5. This is our last message in this series, and then we're moving on. And uh, so if you're tired of it, good news, it's over. Uh, if you want more of it, you can go watch it on YouTube. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 17, it says, When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, they went up in full force to search for him. But David heard about it and went down to the stronghold. Now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of the Lord, shall I go and attack the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hands? The Lord answered him, go, for I will surely deliver the Philistines into your hands. So David went to baal Perazim, and there he defeated them. He said, as waters break out, the Lord has broken out or broken through. Against my enemies before me. So that place was called Baal Perazim. Now, if you've been here for the last couple of weeks, you know that as we've talked about this and uh, we've been talking about this series, Breakers, that Baal Perazim means the place where God broke through. Another definition would be the God of the breakthrough. The valley of Rephaim meant the place of the house of giants. So this is so cool. When David saw God work on his behalf, he renamed the place of giants the place of breakthrough. Can I just declare something from the very outset this, this morning? Is that God wants to make the place of your greatest battle, the place of your greatest giant, the place of your greatest struggle, the place of your greatest breakthrough. How many like for that to happen? The place of my greatest struggle becoming the place of my greatest breakthrough. This is what happened for David. And this is what we've been talking about in this series as we have identified as God doesn't just have breakthrough, I carry breakthrough. I want you to go to Mark chapter 4, and uh, I'm actually going to read it to you in the message translation. It's a paraphrase translation, and this is where we'll get the rest of our message this morning. We'll have it on the screens for you at all our campuses. Mark chapter 4, verse 13, it says, he continued, this is Jesus, do you see how this story works? All my stories work this way. The farmer plants the word. Some people are like the seed that falls on the hardened soil of the road. No sooner do they hear the word than Satan snatches away what has been planted in them. And some are like the seed that lands in the gravel. When they first hear the word, they respond with great enthusiasm. But there is such shallow soil of character that when the emotions wear off and some difficulty arrives, there is nothing to show for it. Ooh, pause. The seed cast in the weeds represents the ones who hear the kingdom news but are overwhelmed with worries about all the things they have to do and all the things they want to get. The stress strangles what they heard. And nothing comes of it. But the seed planted in the good earth represents those who hear the word, embrace it, and produce a harvest beyond their wildest dreams. I want you to know this about God. Is his plan for you is a life beyond your wildest dreams. His plan for you, his purpose for you is a life that is beyond, that's, that's greater than your wildest dreams dreams. If, if, if I could have like a subtitle for this message, this is what I call it. I would call it Buried Breakthrough. Buried Breakthrough. We talked a couple weeks ago about how the, the four friends uncovered the roof to get their friend to Jesus. They uncovered breakthrough. They, they, they took it off layer by layer by layer. See, sometimes breakthroughs buried. This parable is a story by Jesus, and this is oftentimes how Jesus preached. He preached in stories. He would tell people a story with a greater truth, a greater meaning. And so when he was preaching, he would not give a lot of theological thoughts. He would give a lot of stories that connected to their life and to their, to, to their season of life. And so he told a story about a farmer. They understood farming. In that land, in that place, and geographically, there was all kinds of farmers. They understood this. And he talked about a seed that fell on all kinds of different soil, buried Breakthrough. I wonder how many of us have buried breakthrough. Breakthrough just beneath the surface. Breakthrough closer than we think. Breakthrough, you can't see it, but it's, it's there. Breakthrough on its way. Breakthrough coming soon. Breakthrough, breakthrough. Believing in breakthrough. Breakthrough is a process. It's not an event. 
Breakthrough is a process. I always thought breakthrough was an event. It just happens. I've been describing it as the karate chop of heaven. That's why I always thought breakthrough was. It just, hi You know, as God breaks through into my situation, it's over. Everything, my struggles are gone. My trouble's gone. He bro- but breakthrough is not that. Breakthrough looks like breakthrough to the people watching. Breakthrough never feels like breakthrough to the people that are in the process. And breakthrough is a process. It is not an event. We've talked about in this series the mentality of a breaker, the way that we think, the attitude of, bre- of a breaker, the stubbornness to not give up, the identity of a breaker, the breakthroughs in me. But I want to talk to you today about the, this is how we'll conclude this series, the testing of a breaker. The testing. How, how many love tests? That's, that's what I thought. That's what, that's what I thought. I mean, Tess, I, I was homeschooled, grew up homeschooled, and uh, survived, homeschool survivor, and, um, and, and, and we used to go to like this little co-op thing every once in a while to do testing, make sure we were doing all right, and uh, I got kicked out of the co-op a couple times, it's like, man, you know, it's just, I, I was just, you know, anyways, and it's another story for another time, got kicked out, but, but when we do a test, they would get the Scantrons out, and they would give us instruction how we're supposed to fill out the Scantron, make a circle heavy and dark, if you'd like to change an answer, erase the mark you made, and make a new mark, I mean, they went through all the instructions, but I don't know if you're like me, there was this couple different situations when I had a test, and I looked at the Scantron, and the Scantron looked at me, and there's multiple choices, and I don't know the answer, so you do the, you do the Holy Ghost hover. <laughs> do you know what that is? You get your pencil, and you put it over A, and you're like, God, is it it? Is this it? No. B? Is it? Yeah, that feels right. And then if you're not saved, you just make a cool diagram. It's like, surely it can't be three A's in a row. Let's put a B over here. I mean, you just, you just do your best. You, you know what's interesting about a test is a lot of people get angry when they're surprised by a test. You ever been surprised by a test? Like, like your teacher just all of a sudden, hey, surprise, we have a test. Now, the reason that we're angry about a surprise test is because we didn't have time to prepare in advance, right? There was no preparation. There was no cramming the night before because I didn't know the test was coming. But in fact, the teacher is testing you on material that you should know. This is embarrassing to admit, but this actually hit me this week. All the times I've been mad at surprise tests, they never test me as a surprise to make sure I would fail. They test me as a surprise to make sure I knew the material. I just thought teachers were mean. I just thought they were trying to make me fail. I, I, I had one teacher, she taught, she taught science, and she had, she, I am, I'm 38, and I can't grow a beard, but at whatever age she was, she had a, she had a better beard than I can ever grow, and um, I always liked her. She was awesome. She was, is that right to say? Too late. I, it happened. But I was always intrigued. I'm like, man, you, you're, you're a cool girl. Like, that's, that's just, that's cool how you do that. Like, I, I can't, and you can. And she loves surprise tests. I don't know what that is, surprise test. You you know what? When when you're serving God, tests always come as a surprise. And I think sometimes when the test hits, we get mad, don't we? Like, God, wow, if you would have told me this was coming, I would have prepared. I would have crammed last night to get ready for the test that's coming today. But you never know when the test is going to come. Isn't that the struggle? Is not knowing when life is going to get difficult. Not knowing when something's going to go wrong. Not knowing when a curveball is going to come in the beautiful rhythm of your everyday life. That, friends, is a test. It's the testing of a breaker. In fact, James says that, that trouble will test you. It will test you to prove you. You'll be proven by your testing. A test is meant to assess the absorption of a previous teaching or truth. So this tells me something else, that God would never test me in something he hasn't tried to teach me. That God would never test me in something that he has not tried, operative word, tried, to teach me. That means in my life journey, In my life process, he's taught me things. And those things that he's taught me are the things that I have to pull from in the middle of the test. 
Because if breakthrough was easy, everybody would be walking in breakthrough. If breakthrough was just like something that you just thought about and it happened, everybody would have breakthrough. But there is a testing that's involved with breakthrough. And the testing is not a testing if God's good or not. The testing is not if God's able or not. The testing is actually my own heart. The testing is in my own mind. The testing is in me. The test is not the test of the breakthrough. It's the test of the breaker. The seed is good. It's the soil that needs to be right. This is the parable. They say it's the parable of the sower. But i got to be honest with you, it's not really the parable of the sower. It could be, however Bible translators called it, it makes sense, it works, but it would be better translated the parable of the soil. Because what Jesus is communicating to them is not a seed that is rejected by the soil It's a soil that's rejecting the seed. The the seed is powerful. The seed is effective. The seed is the Word of God. This is what Jesus describes it as. The seed is the living Word of God. It can be the gospel. It can be the written Word of God. It can be the spoken Word of God. And we have heard over and over and over again in this series that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So this word, this seed is a word that goes forward. And, and it, this, this parable talks about a couple different things that happens when the seed falls on the soil. The first illustration that he gives us is that the seed was snatched. It was snatched by the birds of the air. Theologians believe that this was speaking about hardened soil. Soil that had been so beat down, so worked, so walked upon, that it had become hard instead of soft. And the seed would fall on the hard soil and it would fall to the wayside and the birds would eat it up. And Jesus used that as an analogy saying that for some of you, your hearts are hard. They have become hardened and the word of God now falls on your hardened heart. And falls off along the wayside and the enemy comes and snatches promises that should be yours. How do you think your heart gets hardened? How do you think your heart gets hardened? It gets hardened by hurt, disappointment, abuse. There is a, a hardening that happens when you go through discouraging situations or you encounter disappointment. There is a hardening that can happen because when you hear something like God is the God of miracles, for some of you, that made faith leap in your heart. But for some of you who have had some disappointments, the seed fell off and it was snatched away because you thought, I don't know, he didn't do a miracle last time. And he didn't do a miracle when I really needed it. And in my friend and in my kids. and Because the soil has become hard. So this is what Jesus begins to talk about. And he's talking about contextually. He's talking about the gospel. But he goes even further saying the word of God. The sower is not God. It's anyone who throws the word. Today I'm sowing. Because I'm throwing you the word of God. Whenever you read the word of God. Declare the word of God. You're the sower. The seed is that word, and some of it was snatched. Calluses, if you ever got calluses on your hand from working out or or working outside, you get calluses. You know how calluses formed? Consistent friction or pressure that happens over and over and over again until the skin hardens to a point where it can't be penetrated or it can't be cut. And oftentimes in a callus, you lose feeling. You know what happens for many of us? Is that we go through life and we're hit again and again and again. We become calloused to the miracle working word of God. The seed was snatched. Another other scripture it says that some of the seed landed in the gravel. This represents people that when they first hear the word, they respond with great enthusiasm. But there's such shallow soil of character, so shallow. Shallow soil. Shallow soil. Have you ever had somebody, man, they get so excited about God, they're just on fire. And about three months later, you're like, where did they go? 
Where, where did they go? I remember when I had my encounter with God when I was 16 years old, I was on fire. I mean, like, embarrassingly on fire. I mean, I'm preaching to everybody everywhere, praying for every- I mean, if you, had, if you were strutting too hard, I would think it was a limp and lay hands and pray for you. I mean, it's just like, I mean, I, I was looking for a miracle to happen on fire. And you know what people told me all the time? People told me, oh, yeah, when you get a little older, you'll calm down. You, it'll all even out. As you begin to get older. But haven't we seen that before? Is the enthusiasm and then it fades? In Jesus' parable, in his story, this is what he tells us. He tells us that the reason that they spring up quickly is because there's no roots. That there is no depth. Theologians believe that when it's on the rocky soil, that because the soil was compacted between the top of the soil and the rocks, that there was a compact growing experience where it would cause the plant to come above the surface too soon. Ooh. It caused it to come above the surface too soon, but it didn't have the roots. So as soon as difficulty came, it was pulled out or it was killed. You got to be careful that you don't have shallow roots, that your roots are not hype, that your roots are not just an experience. If, if, if Jesus is just hype to you, he'll leave when the hype leaves. If Jesus is just excitement to you, he'll leave when the excitement leaves. But people, mature believers, real breakers, the testing of a breaker is roots that go down deep in God, that grab on to the truth of his word and the truth of his promise. These are the ones that can't be broken. These are the ones that can't be shaken. These are the ones that can't be moved because their roots have gone down deep into God. Says the, the last one was that they were strangled. They were strangled. This is the seed that fell among the thorns. It says it was strangled. And the, the, the thing that strangled it, the scripture says, it was the worries about all the things they have to do and all the things they want to get. The stress strangles what they heard. Have you ever felt like real life strangled what God was trying to say? You ever felt like real life strangled away the last bit of hope that you had? You're trying to stand in faith. You're trying not to walk in fear. You're trying to believe God. You're trying to have faith. And, and, and it's like life just strangles it. You know what this represents? This represents having no room. It's called mixture. That I'm going to grow with God while I grow with the world. I'm going, to give, I'm going to have God's ability while I use my ability. The, 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 the plants, the, the seed can't survive in a strangled environment where God is not the only thing. He's not a thing. He's the thing. He's not a God. He's the God. It's not Jesus and. It's Jesus, period. And for many, Jesus is saying, many have been, the, the word, the seed has been strangled in their hearts. So what do we do? This is what verse 20 says. It says, but the seed planted in the good earth represents those who hear the word, embrace it, and produce a harvest beyond their wildest dreams. So what do we do? We hear the word. Hear, that's what it said. Hear the word. We, you put yourself in an environment where you're hearing the word. All of the time, you're hearing the word. You've memorized the word. You meditate on the word. You listen to the preaching of the word all the time. Listen, if you are struggling and you haven't listened to the word yet, before you go to counseling, before you call somebody, before you complain to another person, go Read the word of God. I know it's old school. I know it's cliche. But the word of God is the inspired word of God. It is the living word of God. It still has power for today. It still has power for your life. And I've got to know what the seed is. I've got to know. The seed is the word. I've got to know what the seed is. It says you have to hear the word. We've been saying this for our series. Wherever there is a disconnect between God's truth and my reality... I must contend for breakthrough. Do you know what God's truth is? Do you know what God's truth is for your family? Do you know what God's truth is for your mental clarity? Do you know what God's truth is for your assignment? Do you know what God's truth is for your relationships? Do you know what God's truth is for your marriage? You have to hear the word. The hearing of that word is what produces faith. 
But it's not, a, it's not enough just to hear it. You also have to work it. So this is what I want to start closing down with. I got to hear the word, but I got to work. I got to work the word. I got to hear the word, but I have to work. I got, I got to work it. A lot of people know it. A lot of people have heard it, but few people work it. Because if you worked it, it would begin to produce a harvest in your life. We would be able to tell by your demeanor. We would be able to tell by your attitude. We would be able to tell how you go through trouble and how you go through testing. If you've actually worked the word or not. When I was 18, I was just graduated high school. And I was skinny and small in high school. I weighed 145 pounds as a senior in high school. And I graduated high school, and I'm like, I'm done with that. I'm done with that. So I started eating like crazy. I started working out like crazy. And uh, I was talking to a guy, and, you know, he, you always talk to the guy that's, like, way bigger than you. So I'm like, I saw this guy at church, and I'm like, bro, whatever you're doing, I need to do. I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, man, you got to work. I'm like, I'm ready to work. Let's do it. So we went to the gym. We started working. I've been there like three weeks. I'm still skinny, and I'm still small. And I'm like, hey, bro, like, you obviously got something working for you. Are you taking something I don't know about? Or like, <laughs> what's, like, I, I'm still the same. And uh, I'll never forget, he told me, you got to work it till it works. Ooh, you got to work it till it works. You got to work it till it works. Got to work it. You know what's crazy? About three months later, I started seeing some change. About six months later, I started seeing some change. About a year later, I'm like, I'm like not even stopping. Now I'm just like, oh, yeah, because it's, it's working. When you see it work, it gives you motivation. Some of you know this story, but when I was, me and Jamie were dating, and I was about to go see her in Thailand, and man, I was like, man, I've been working out. I was pumped up. I put on 30 pounds of pure muscle, and I'm just, I'm, I'm ready to go. I, and I overhear her, right when I get there, I overhear her talking to someone. She's like, I can't stand those guys. They're just always in the gym. Those gym rats, just always focused on their body. And I'm like, I guess I'm going to lose the weight again. You gotta work it till it works. Wiley, you gotta work it till it works. You gotta work it. Oh, I tried. No, the testing of a breaker is I work till it works. I work till it works. The word of God will work if you work it. I gotta work it till it works. I've heard the word. I have faith. I am a breaker. I have the mentality. I have the attitude. I have the identity, but I'm about to pass the test. I'm going to work it. I'm going to work it. I'm going to work it. I'm going to work it until it works. I'm going to work it until I see it. I'm going to work it until it produces. I'm going to work it till I see a harvest. I'm going to work it till I see a breakthrough. I'm going to work it till they get saved. I'm going to work it till I have success. I'm going to I'm going to work it till it works. I'm not responsible for the harvest. I'm responsible for the seed having good soil to grow in. The seed, the breakthrough will take care of itself. My responsibility as a breaker, as a Christian, as a man of God is to be responsible for the soil of my own heart. That's the crux of the story was not that the seed wasn't good. The seed was good. It just fell on some places, some soil that wasn't ready. Your job is your heart. God's job is to bring the harvest. Your job is the soil of your own heart, putting the word of God and working it till it works. Working it till it works. You know what I found to be true is there will always be a test between here and there. Between where I am now and where God's taking me, there will always be a test. And I don't think it's coincidence that in Mark chapter 4, Jesus teaches this parable. And at the end of the chapter, Jesus sends the disciples out on the boat. You remember this story? He sends them out on the boat and Jesus falls asleep on the boat. This is right after this parable. Same chapter. And Jesus says, we're going from here and we're going there. And the disciples got excited. They got on the boat. Breakthrough is on the way. Breakthrough. We're going to breakthrough. We're going to breakthrough. And in the process of going from here to there, a storm. Oh, isn't that how it works? A storm came. Storms sometimes make us wonder if we've missed it. 
Storms sometimes make us wonder if we're on the wrong boat. Storms sometimes make us wonder why Jesus is sleeping. They're on the boat. The storm is battering the ship. Jesus is asleep. He's asleep. You ever felt like Jesus is asleep? Wind raging. Storm raging. Mind racing. Heart racing. Jesus is asleep. So the disciples, you know it was Peter. Peter woke him up. I know it was Peter because Peter's always putting his foot in his mouth. He'd be like, I got it. Jesus! You know, I mean, he's ready. Jesus jumps up, speaks to the wind and to the waves, and I want to share a scripture with you. Mark chapter 4, verse 39, in the message translation. He says, awake now. He told the wind to pipe down. I like that. What if Jesus just looked at the storm of your life and was like, pipe down? Sounds like something my dad told me growing up. Pipe down. He says, pipe down. And he said to the sea, quiet, settle down. The wind ran out of breath. I like that a lot. The sea became smooth as glass. And Jesus reprimanded the disciples. Why are you such cowards? Don't you have any faith at all? Here's the crazy thing. Jesus didn't have to calm the storm. They would have been fine. They would have got to where they were going, whether he calmed it or not. It was the love and the grace of Jesus that calmed their storm for them. It was. He didn't need to calm it. He told them to pipe down. He's telling the wind, like, whoa, whoa, just take it easy. These guys can't, they can't hang. Like, just take it easy. He didn't have to do it, but he did it for them. But this is what's wild. It says the wind ran out of breath. The thing that was propelling the storm eventually had nothing left to give. So let me tell you, say it this way. The test of a breaker is can you outweigh the wind? On the process from here to there, can you outweigh the wind? The storm will come against you. The opposition will come against you. Life will come against you. Relationships will come against you. But can you outweigh the wind? That's the question, friend. The test of a breaker is a commitment. It's a diligence. It's a stubbornness. It's a persistence that I will outweigh the wind. The storm is raging. But Jesus said, I'm going to the other side. And he won't let me die. He won't let me drown. His promise was that I would make it. The soil of my heart is ready. The soil of my heart is open. God, plant your word in my heart and take me to the other side. Can you outweigh the wind? Thanks for listening to the Church 1132 broadcast. You can join us live every Sunday during our worship experience or at church1132.com.